The hydrosphere isn't just liquid water. It also includes the cryosphere, or the frozen water on Earth, the glaciers, ice sheets, and permafrost. And the ice? Well, the ice is melting. Let's begin with a demonstration of albedo, which is the proportion of light that is reflected by a surface. Having a high albedo means a surface is very reflective and doesn't absorb much light. A low albedo means the surface is generally dark and absorbs a lot of light. Let's imagine two lamps. Each one is above a different surface. Let's attach a thermocouple just underneath each light source. Let's go ahead and turn on the lights for one hour and measure the temperature. I'll fast forward the hour. Notice the temperature above the dark surface got much warmer. Light is coming from the lamp and hitting each surface. The lighter surface has a much higher albedo, so more light is reflecting, so less heat is produced. Meanwhile, the dark surface has a low albedo, so more light is being absorbed. As a result, much more heat is produced. Let's keep this phenomena in mind as we venture into the Arctic. Kitty here doesn't go to the Arctic. No, Kitty here doesn't like the cold. Go. Go away. Because global temperatures are increasing, the rate at which the ice is melting is increasing. But there's a feedback cycle happening here. Below the ice is, well, bedrock, and as the ice melts, more bedrock becomes exposed. And because the bedrock has a low albedo, the temperature increases faster, which melts more ice, which exposes more bedrock, which melts more ice, so on and so forth. This feedback cycle has resulted in the polar regions of Earth warming at a faster rate than the rest of the planet. All this melting has reduced the size of glaciers by quite a bit. Now, a glacier is best defined as a moving river of ice that forms on mountains and near the poles. This is different from sea ice, which is just, well, frozen seawater. Arctic sea ice has seen a sharp decline. In 2016, the Arctic sea ice was 700,000 square miles less than the historical average. This change is visible from space. Another effect of melting ice is the release of gases trapped in the ice, which introduces yet another feedback cycle. As the ice melts, it releases more gases which contribute to warming. Methane released from the melting of ice has substantially increased since the 1980s and is currently responsible for 0.2% of all methane emissions. Now, 0.2% doesn't sound like a lot, but that's 17 million tons of methane every year. All this ice, when it melts, flows into the oceans. Cumulatively, the world's oceans have risen by 10 inches since the 1800s as a result of this ice melt. This rise in sea level has increased the number of flood days in coastal cities which has an economic impact on these areas, but also a health impact as the high water levels spread pollutants, especially wastewater that may contain harmful bacteria throughout coastal cities. This map shows the amount of land converted to, well, open water ocean along the Atlantic coast through 2011, the most recent year we have data. This encroachment of ocean on the land may lead to the displacement of people farther away from the coast. The melting of sea ice and increasing temperatures causing changes to ocean circulation. You see, the currents in the ocean, or the way water flows throughout the planet, is slowing down. These ocean currents spread out the temperature of the ocean, bringing warmer water to the Arctic regions where it loses heat before coming back down into the tropical region. As these currents slow down, more oceanic heat will be retained near the tropics. And it's the heat of the ocean that creates cyclone storms like hurricanes. This has been hypothesized to increase the severity of storms, especially hurricanes. 
While the number of storms hasn't changed by much, the frequency of severe hurricanes has increased. So we may not see more hurricanes, but the number of hurricanes we see that are categorized as severe, so category four or five, may very well become higher. The overall temperature of the ocean is increasing as well. The overall sea surface temperature has increased by about one degree Fahrenheit above the historical average. And the total heat energy absorbed by the whole ocean, so not just the surface, has also increased. This increase in ocean temperature has been causing damage to marine wildlife. Because many fish that live in colder waters are adapted to dealing with well, cold water, the excess heat is causing metabolic stress. All this combined with warm water holding less oxygen, we expect to see either a decline in fish populations or a shift in their natural range. Uh, fish that survive in warm waters are also struggling and are also moving farther in towards, well, farther north and southern latitudes where the waters may not be quite as warm. One of the largest threats of ocean warming is the bleaching of coral reefs. For reasons we don't fully understand, when the water is too warm, corals will kick out the algae that they otherwise have a symbiotic relationship with. It's also where they get all their pretty colors from. Now, coral reefs support about 25% of all marine biodiversity, and all of that is dependent on this symbiosis between corals and the algae. When coral bleaching occurs, the biodiversity in coral reefs plummets, and well, some reef ecosystems have recovered from a bleaching effect, but quite a few have not. Warming is not the only thing that can cause coral bleaching. Ocean acidification can too. Now the ocean is a large carbon sink and while the majority of the carbon dioxide absorbed in the ocean is due to photosynthesis of algae and phytoplankton, an increasing amount of this carbon dioxide is just being dissolved into the water. Now because humans continue to pump more carbon dioxide into the air and with deforestation reducing the capacity of terrestrial ecosystems to act as carbon sinks, all this additional oceanic carbon dioxide cannot be immediately used by photosynthesizers in the ocean. This dissolved carbon dioxide reacts with water molecules to form carbonic acid, which is causing ocean acidification. Before we get into the impacts of ocean acidification, let's first look at how organisms such as corals and other calcifiers like crabs, lobsters, shellfish, how do all those actually build their shells and exoskeletons? These organisms need to get two primary ingredients from the environment, calcium ions and carbonate ions. Both of these are introduced into oceans through the weathering of rock and the sediment deposition from rivers, but these compounds also cycle through food webs in the oceans. Either way, calcifiers will utilize both calcium and carbonate to produce calcium carbonate, which is what the exoskeletons are primarily composed of. Ocean acidification is the process by which the pH of the ocean is decreased. Let's quickly review what an acid is. An acid is a substance that releases hydrogen ions when dissolved in solution. So what's releasing the hydrogen ions that is causing a decrease in ocean pH? Well, that's carbonic acid. When carbon dioxide dissolves into the ocean, it can react with water to produce carbonic acid. When carbonic acid forms in the ocean, it disassociates into a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion, HCO3 minus. So now there is more H plus ions in solution. Let's go back to those main ingredients calcifiers need, a source of calcium and a source of carbonate. Hydrogen ions react with carbonate, converting it into bicarbonate. So the more carbonic acid forms, the more H plus ions are in the ocean, the fewer carbonate ions are now available for calcifiers. Bicarbonate cannot be used to build shells and exoskeletons. So as a result, organisms end up with much weaker structures, making them more susceptible to breaking from tides, waves, and other disturbances. The oceans are the source of two thirds of all the oxygen we breathe. Economically, we rely on it for food and tourism, recreation, these changes to the ocean between acidification, warming, which causes a decline in coral reefs and the fish they rely on, 
and the increasing severity of storms and sea level rise threatening coastal cities, we really need to consider how we're doing things here. The general thought in environmental science is the world will adjust, chemistry will persist, evolution will continue, and the planet will be fine. It'll look different, but it'll be okay. The question is, will humans be okay? Will we adjust to a changing planet? Or will Homo sapiens just be the next species to meet the same fate as the other human species? Now, between Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalus, Homo habilis, all being extinct, we're the only humans remaining. For now.